Hi, I'm Audrey Grabasek, your host for Offsite Dirt. We are the channel, the media construction channel for everything offsite, technology, events, software, you name it. We're here, we're discussing it. Today's a very exciting show. When we talk about building, there are measurements of energy, energy that flows in, energy that flows out. There's different modeling techniques. There's different ways to measure it. So with that today, we have three guests. We have Mark, we have Emily, and we have Joe. I'm gonna have each one of you introduce yourself and maybe give us a little background on energy. Well, thank you, Audrey. My name is Mark Willie, and uh, to me, energy is not only about the building in front of us and what it took to construct it, but how much that building is actually using to operate. Love it. Emily, give us your background. Uh, I work with a company called Eco Achievers, and we do a lot of analysis on buildings from the beginning before they're ever built and just an idea, and then throughout construction and to the end to see how they're actually performing. Perfect. And Joe, give us your background and what company you're with. I'm Joe Konopaki. My company is Insight Property Services. We're a building consulting company. Um, we also do testing on new construction homes, primarily uh, single family new construction, uh, but we do a lot of forensic investigations of, of existing homes. And so we get to see how homes maybe have come up short or how they're failing because of poor initial design and, and construction. So this is kind of the first, you know, when I'm talking and I'm always constantly learning, I think that's why I love being in this position to be able to have these conversations. And this is all your world, right? You love being in this. This is kind of what you do. So we're gonna break it down a little bit. So Joe, I'm gonna start with you. Can you give me an overview of why we need these services from your company? Um, homes have changed significantly uh, in the last 100 years. Um, they started out as basically just wooden shells of a box that needed a lot of heat and, and had no air conditioning. Um, and ventilation was just what Mother Nature pushed through the holes that were left behind. Um, nowadays, we can build homes that are more like a sealed cooler. And in that house, you really don't have much heating or cooling. Your biggest system is just a fresh air you know, heat exchanger uh, to get fresh air into the home and to deal with and maybe some dehumidification as well. So somewhere, the heating system peters out to nothing and the ventilation system shows up and has to increase in capacity. Um, and we're helping people understand, mostly with existing homes, where along that spectrum is your house and what kind of equipment mix should it have considering how it's performing or how you'd like it to perform. So Emily, tell us about what type of client comes to you. That's a good question. Uh, I feel like they, there's a lot of different types of clients we actually have. Um, it could be developer, architect, um, single family homeowner, or, or you know buyer that wants to build their own home. I think for the most part, we have developers that come to us. Um, we consult on green building certifications, and a lot of uh, funding is tied to green building certifications. So we can help you from the beginning. Say, um, you know, what are you looking for? What funding are you going for? What certification best fits what kind of building you want to build, um, and then consult through that process of um, the design and into and through construction. So Mark, I'm going to lead to you when she's talking about building green. What does that actually mean in the energy spectrum? I guess in the energy spectrum, um, it's it's more about uh, a reduction from what we're used to and uh, limiting the waste. So um, we didn't really focus on the waste prior. We had the, the abundance of cheap energy. So I believe uh, the green side is to require less energy. So therefore, you're not wasting it. Makes sense. I, I, yeah. Very simple, right? I guess yeah. we need to make it more simplified. Yeah. I'm thinking that it's this big, massive, you know, massive thing that we have to undertake, and I think I just need to know it step by step. So Emily, when the um, client or the developer comes to you and they want to have this initiative, they want to have this green initiative. This is what they want to have their building, um, you know, calculated at. What is the next step? How does that process work? 
It depends on which certification we're going for, mm -hmm. but most of them uh, require energy modeling as an initial review of the building. Okay. So we'll talk through the early plan sets, usually you know DD sets, just the early idea of what they're they're looking to do, um, and make initial energy models to see what the performance of that building is expected to be. Most uh, green certifications have performance requirements that you have to meet. Um, so are you lining up with that uh, anticipated, um, or is the building that you're, you're designing right now in line to, to reach those goals or do we maybe need to make some changes to get you there? Joe, how can you elaborate on that? Where do you kind of fit into that puzzle? Um, we're working more on the um, uh, testing during construction side of uh, things. So, um, I mean, you can have a great design, but if it doesn't come together in the real world, um, it's hard to go back and fix things. Right. Um, one of the biggest laments that homeowners have is how come this wasn't done during construction? And in, with residential construction, it's typically they didn't know any better. Um, I mean, those were the practices of the day, uh, but that's not the case. We know better. There's better products out there, better equipment. All that has to come together in a different combination. Um, and so, I mean, I appreciate builders that you know, have been doing this for 20, 30, 40 years. But if you've been building the same house for the last 40 years, you're 40 years behind. It makes sense. It makes a lot of sense to me. And so when I look at that and I think about energy and I think I'm in the offsite construction space, right? And so yep. for us, a lot of our buildings, most of our buildings, whether they be panelized, whether they be volumetrics, they're all built in a factory and they're all built to specific uh, municipality building codes. And those, bo those codes dictate what type of energy, what kind of building envelope that's going to go into those. Being that that's the case and that we're talking about offsite and we're seeing this big change, are you seeing different companies or different people start being more aware and doing things like that in the offsite space? Go ahead, Joe. <laughs> Take it away. Um, honestly, I've had little experience with, with the panelized offsite construction. You know, it's more than it was before, so we're, we'd like to see it kind of on the upswing. Um, but the nice thing about the, the, the panelized offsite construction is that it gets together on site very quickly. Um, you're dried in in no time, and that's usually what um, causes problems with a good percentage of, of construction homes is that they're getting precipitation, you know, snow, rain, whatever, um, really getting into the, and, and increasing the, the moisture load inside the building. And then during construction, before somebody moves in, all that has to get removed if mold hasn't grown in the meantime you know so panelized construction is great because again it goes together really fast um but you know devil's in the details you know those panels have to come together right and again testing it while the assembly is going together is, is ideal because then any issues can be caught early corrected before the next you know next phase of construction continues you don't want to have to go back under cladding or anything else to go fix something that didn't get together put to get put together properly three weeks ago mm -hmm. so I also think an uh, advantage to panelized uh, construction is there are a lot of efficiency measures we're looking at in a building as it's being constructed. And um, like we come to do insulation inspections and we look at framing and all these different things. With the panelized construction, you can look at how that's being designed, you know, how that's being put together actually in the, um, in the factory and see, okay, it looks like, you know, this is being done. This is, this is of good quality. It's being done like this. It's this material. Okay, this is how it's going to go into the house instead of having a lot of different contractors coming in and being subject to, okay, are they, are they putting the insulation into what's called grade one? Is it you know perfectly installed, um, and having to keep you know checking on all of those things? So. I love that you know this. It makes me so happy, Emily, <laughs> that you're seeing this and you're expanding into that space because I really do believe in the next five to ten years. You know, we're looking at new construction. Obviously, it sounds like a lot of this has to do with the pre-construction, your pre-construction team, right? And getting involved in it and knowing what that conversation is and where we're trying to go and what we're trying to 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 reach in the, in that process but it's also about measurement and it's also about modeling and it's all about all these different techniques are these techniques new or have they always been around emily oh that's a that's a good i wouldn't say always been around <laughs> but um 
they've grown exponentially in more recent years. I'd say that um, it's definitely growing. Uh, but I've, I've been doing this for five years. So I, I guess maybe you could probably speak to how long. <laughs> it's, I've only I've been doing it just over 10. So um, so it's, it's fairly new. We're seeing that people are wanting it. We know yeah. that there is a huge need for it. We're seeing that measurements and tools and modeling are so specifically needed, which is great. And now we actually have companies that are doing it and providing it. Are you seeing a lot of municipalities and people demanding that these things be met or are you seeing it more on the individual company or the builder that actually wants to be the best that they can be for performing for their clients? Joe, what, what are you seeing? It's a little bit of both. You know, you have some municipalities that are that are saying, hey, you know, if you want to build, it's going to have to be to this to this level. Right. Especially with the multifamily, you know, buildings um, and uh, but there always could be more, you know, there could be more municipalities that, that care about it to, to say, hey, we're setting the bar here, not here, right? Um, and it's the same thing with, uh, with builders. You have some builders that are, I like to say, true believers, right? They, they understand the value of it and they go, I want to build better than code, which is the, you know, That's minimum Minimum standard. Minimum standard. It's D minus. <laughs> I'm sorry, there's no other way to look it at it. It's better every time, though. Yes, today, today's D minus is better than. 10 right. years ago or 20 up, years ago. Right? So We're D minus, D minus has been getting tougher. <laughs> All fairness, it's been getting tougher, yeah. but it's still a D minus. So, um, you know, we like to see builders that are go, you know what, I could build a good enough home or I could build a house that um, I'd like to put one of my family members in. You know, and, and it's a funny thing because it's not always the same, you know, quality of construction when it's, you know, rank and file customers or family members and, and that, has always bugged me because like, you know, that house should be, you know, of, of a set quality. Maybe the finishes might be different, but the insulation, the air tightness, the window quality, all that stuff should be fairly standard, whether it's a high ticket client or, you know, a, a you know, market rent or low income, you know, multi-unit building. I mean, the quality of construction should be of higher standard and should be fairly uniform. We can vary on the finishes and, and how it's financed and all the rest of that stuff, but the core of the building should be, you know, high quality and, and generally higher performance. Mark, what are you seeing in the industry? What's happening on, in your side of the world? It's optimization on the front end. And um, that, that point that you brought up is, is where I really see it always happening. So in the site built, right, people's availability uh, based on the contractors and, and subcontractors, it's an ebb and a flow. However, in the offsite, I'm used to strict sequencing. You can't move a wall down a line and back it up and move it down the line. The, the optimal way of moving it is from the framing through the mechanical, the checkpoints, that all that is there the insulation and moving forward. So I think sequencing we know is the best method and we would love to do that on site as much as we can and when that's not always possible. So when we have it in our panelized uh, systems, now we know the deliverability is there in terms of timing, right? Yeah. But everything is done in the proper order and when you do that in the proper order, you can now spend the time on precision. And my favorite phrase by an amazing man is precision equals performance, right? And every time you take that step, the next group after you reaps the benefit. Um, we have controlled processes. We didn't always have 16 on center or 24 on center. It's a standard that most of us in our careers know, but that was brought into the fold, just like everything else. So, hey, we're kind of stuck with four by eight sheets. So let's optimize around these four by eight sheet goods. Love that. Emily, tell us, has there been a project, a challenging project that you have faced that um, you'd like to share and what was the outcome? Oh, what type of challenge are we talking about? Um, the projects can, yeah, there's been projects that have been challenging and I think the biggest 
challenges come from uh, passive house projects that are mul these multifamily projects and passive house is becoming more popular, um, but that also means that there's a lot of people doing it for the first time. And so we get into whole building, blower door testing, and that is a really difficult metric to meet. I mean, we're looking at these big buildings and for reference code uh, requirement for, for air changes per hour. Um, it, that's, that's the metric for the full volume of the building, how much it would change uh, get moved per hour, um, simulating a 20 mile per hour wind, but um, it's for ACH 50. So that's that's code. We're looking at getting these buildings. We have one multifamily building. It was testing around 1.2 air changes per hour, and it's still not meeting the metric um, to to meet passive house, which is it's not in air changes per hour, but just for reference, even that much lower than code is still not quite there yet. Uh, and, and the challenge with that tends to come both in the design phase where we have to communicate between architects and between builders and the architects will make really great details and then we need to talk to the builders and say, hey, is this, is this buildable? And you need to come together and, and there's the most amount of coordination is needed for these projects to make sure that um, the really good details are, prepare, are made and everybody's prepared <laughs> to, to carry them through the project. Um, so that's that's a, that's our biggest our most challenging projects are are usually getting projects through that um, that and it's and it's interesting that you that you talk about that because I recall when I was doing my own projects um, in modular construction the whole building was there right and then we're doing the blower test mm -hmm. right and so. Actually, Joe, I'm going to ask you, and I don't know if this is, you know, if this is the right question, because I, I could probably frame it with, with Emily, but what is a blower test so people kind of understand what that really is? It's a big fan that, that sets up in the, in the open door of a house. So the a canvas frame closes off the rest of the opening, your fan is left in the bottom. And for big buildings, you might have two fans, three fans, six fans. Um, it all depends on how big the house is. Most single family homes, a single fan is, is plenty. And you can get a, actually a pretty good sized home and one fan's enough to move there. The idea is that the fan pulls air out and it can measure how much air it's moving. It brings it down the home down to a test pressure. And once it's at that test pressure, we say, okay, here's how much air is now moving through the building. Um, I like to think like, you know, if. Uh, if it's really tight, you get to test pressure in a second. It's just like a, a kid sucking on a two liter pop bottle. That thing will just collapse like that. <laughs> um, mo but a lot of homes are like a pop bottle with uh, 17 holes stabbed in it and uh, good luck trying to pull a pressure on that. Um, so, and it, it, it's, it's illuminating. I mean, or it's, it's enlightening, sometimes not in a great way for the, for the builders. You know, it's, it's a big spoon of humility when you say, oh, we've built a really great you know, building and then you bring them through when that thing's going, they feel this river of air, you know, coming through. We had a small commercial building and they said, well, where's all this air? And they could feel the air coming through a, a nearby doorway. It was coming from the rest of the building, you know, towards the fans and they feel just this big river of air. And like, where's it coming from? I said, it's bleeding in about 10,000 places in your ceiling. And they're like, no, I'm like, your air barrier is this foil that I told you wasn't going to work. And you proceeded to staple it and cut it around electrical boxes and penetrate. I mean, there's, I'm not joking, there's thousands of openings in this thing. And, and they were, they were, they were going to fail because it was death by a thousand cuts. So when you have that conversation, and I've been in conversations like that, and it feels like it's too late. Is it too late or can there be resolution? And obviously, Emily, we've talked and I understand it's all about pre-planning. It's all about pre-engineering and architect and having those conversations, but you can't and some people don't always do that. So when you're at the, the 10,000 yeah. holes in the ceiling, what happens at that point, Joe? That, that's when you start looking at magic materials and systems. Uh, so in, in trying that- Trying to create yeah, a solution, because construction's always about creating yeah. solutions. In, in that case, if you're trying to seal a building um, and you're not too far into the finishes, um, there's a system called aero barrier. It's basically a, an aerosolized sealant. It, by air pressure, it gets forced out of the, home, out of the building and wherever it finds a little gap where it's leaking out, it'll kind of gum up in that, in that crack. It's kind of like that little glue on the back of a credit card you get in the mail. Um, you know, and as long as there's no finishes, it's not a big deal. But if you have finishes, now you, everything has to mast off. You don't want it to get it on the carpets. And uh, 
So in a, in a, um, a rough construction building, not, not, so, not so bad, and it's a great way to just kind of go, I don't know where the holes are, but we're going to seal them up and then watch the, you know, the computer will tell you exactly how, the, how leakage is being reduced. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's always a puzzle. Yeah. You always feel like you're in this puzzle system of trying to put the pieces together or obviously nobody likes to be in those scenarios. So obvious, obviously we're advocating for doing things before, no. but in your experience and, and knowing where your company is growing, the very first step is having the conversation first off, right? Building your team in, yep. in the very beginning. And is it at the very beginning where the architectural plans start? Or is it the, at the very beginning of the very first conversation of the project? And Mark, I'm gonna, you, can, you can jump in, go ahead. Joe, Joe, Joe pointed to a key point on that 10,000 hole project. It was suggested that the materials they chose, the foil, was not an adequate choice, that there were gonna be complications. Well, sometimes advice is not taken. Sometimes people trip and fall on their own. Um, and then you have to spend more time and more money to fix it. So having the correct team involved in the beginning and the acceptance of this is the strategy. Okay, there's three people that are for it, right? And there's one against it. Okay, four heads are better than three. So let's bring the four together. Let's do the little mock-up. This is gonna take an afternoon or a day or two, but let's see that this foil that we want for some reason, right? Maybe our, our aunt works at the company. So we wanna try, we wanna try the foil. She makes great foil. It didn't work, <laughs> yes. right? Okay, now at least we determine on that mock-up that it didn't work. Okay, now let's proceed with the other suggestions that are perhaps been tried somewhere else or examples shown that this will work for a scenario. We mock it up, it works. Now go ahead and do your 1,000, 2,000, whatever square foot the scenario is so that it's not after the fact where the hands are raised. Avoid the solutions and proceed. Avoid the problems right, right. and proceed. And, and I, yeah. love, I love that you, and, I, and it's actually clearly being defined that having the conversation, testing the products, doing the modeling, these are all things that have to be prepared in the beginning and also having the right partners involved. And listening to them. Yeah, I would say two things to that is that that foil might have worked okay on like a single family um, house that's smaller and more attention is generally paid to each assembly. but. The reason the foil didn't work is because they created so many penetrations through the foil and didn't adequately seal them. I believe that's the reason I wasn't part of this project, but they created all these holes and didn't adequately follow after and seal them. So it's not necessarily the material that was failing, but it's the attention to the detail and understanding that if you wanna use that material, you're gonna have to put a lot of time and effort into making sure that it's you know working properly. Which brings another, you know, kind of another nod to the off-site production because you're you're able to put all your, you know, all of your assembly parts together and make sure that someone's not coming. Well, someone put the foil in, but someone came behind and put something through that. You know, that's not an issue when you're working off-site and everything's coordinated. It's the category we often say um, first. Um, it depends, right? That foil <laughs> might work. And then if you make that step, you trust, but you still have to verify. So there's folks that know they're going to be using something and they get the samples from the architect or the manufacturer and they start playing with it. And they say, oh gosh, you know, this project is Indiana, that architect is used to working in Colorado. Let's, let's put some of these tapes out. It's gonna be nine months before the drawings are finished maybe another four months before the, the permits reviewed, that's a good indicator to start trying this stuff out. When those team members are in the beginning, recipe for success is pretty tasty. Mark, being that you're in Passive House and you have this great experience, are you seeing, is, the, is, this, the, is this the protocol for Passive House or for Green where you are already doing this modeling, you already know these particular things? In the, in the beginning, is this how the modeling starts? Is this how the conversation begins? The modeling begins. It, it, it's certainly up to 
the the team, right? So so what is the team? Does the developer always have the same contractor and architect and crews together? Okay. Well, if they do, then it's a shortcut. We've achieved it on one, and we moved on um, for multi-unit. Bo- bo- both of these two have a lot of multi-unit experience. If you've done one unit, the odds of that second unit being success are good because we've all come to the agreement that this works here. So in Passive House, yes, the modeling happens, but that success is still based on the team and the commitment to make it happen. If you have a bad egg, now at least be alerted that you have the bad egg because when that person's done doing what they do, who's going after them to make sure that it's not an issue for the project? It's going to happen. You will have a bad egg. But measure the success by who's going behind that person. If you make an error, right, it it will happen. You have to cut the air barrier. Great. Whose responsibility is it the air barrier? Because maybe those trades are gone. Maybe it's not a self-performed crew. So at least have the communication there. Project manager might be on vacation. Supervisor might not understand air barrier. The developer and the architect and the certifiers do. So when you have a third party team in, that's an added check system to say, hey guys, this was missed. Great time to fix it. Now we can move on in happiness. Emily, is your company more like a third party um, type of company that would check it? Can you give me a little bit a quick overview of really what your defining role is in that project? Well, third party can have lots of uh, different meanings. Sure. Yeah, yeah, and we're we're third party uh, verifiers for many different project certifications. Okay. So, but that means, and that's the same thing, you know, Joe's coming on and doing as well, where we're looking at, like I mentioned earlier, the insulation. So we're going to come on site. We're going to see what your framing is. Is it framed the way that it was? It's supposed to be on plans. Okay. Um, and then when the insulation is installed is you know we're looking you've got um your your cavity and you want to make sure that the insulation is touching the six sides of the, of that cavity okay. is it is it evenly dispersed um and just because it's more effective when it's put in evenly and, and touching all sides or is it you know crunched up um and and inconsistent uh, so that's one of the examples of the things we're we're the third party verifying but also like blower door testing, duct testing, uh, depending on the certification, there's a slew of, of final testing, bedroom pressures, which is one that I think often gets overlooked, okay. but you're you're measuring the pressure in, in bedrooms in uh, a, a living unit, and um, with, your, with your system, your heating and cooling system running on high, and if there's a pressure buildup, it means that that has not, um, that system hasn't really been balanced. So you don't have enough, you know, a big enough undercut, you don't have a transfer grill, you don't have enough return air leaving that bedroom. So it's not going to be very comfortable. Uh, so things like that, that you might not think about. Oh, and the big one is bath fan exhaust. Oh, the number of times I've so tested crazy. bath fan and nobody thinks about it because you don't normally test your bath fan exhaust, but yeah. dampers are stuck. Somebody didn't take the tape off the damper. It's only, it's so loud and it's only pulling 14 CFM. Or the and siding you, went over it. Yeah, something <laughs> like, yeah. And But you wouldn't know unless you tested it. You're thinking, oh, it's loud because it's pulling all this air, but it's actually not doing anything for you. But you wouldn't know unless you test it. Like you're like making my <laughs> wheels spin because she's well, magical that way. Yeah, yeah it, it's it, it's fascinating because there's so many different components, right? And I love that you're the third party that goes in there, and then you do this review, and then after you do the review, do the, do you then um, give them steps to be able to help them achieve what they're looking for? Mm-hmm. Is that the process? Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the um, really helpful things, so if they're not hitting their blower door mark, for instance, blower door guided air sealing is just key. It's a great thing. We uh, we recommend that builders have their own blower door or they can rent ours if they if they need to. Um, but having builders having their own blower door, if they need to hit targets, which you do for code, um, you, it's, it's really helpful because you can set it up, you can run it and you can say, oh, wow, we sealed these windows, but under the windowsill is just pouring in air and we, you know, 
we didn't know. So now we can go around and hit all those spots and be prepared for our third party tests. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. So Joe, are you, is your company just in the state of Illinois? Are you guys national? We're Illinois. Just Illinois, yeah. okay. So when you look at your company and Mark was referring to doing multifamilies, are you seeing more of an expansion in that space than the single family? And I know we kind of talked a little about, it's it's preference by you know, the company or the person that, or yeah. whoever's coming to you for that service, but in in my in my industry in offsite construction we are seeing a huge growth in multifamily that's like the biggest expansion so are you seeing the same thing in your yeah i mean there? god's not making any more land so you know we're going to make the best <laughs> the best use of what we got and so multifamily is it i can put we can put more dwelling units on uh, on a given you know plot of land um and also it's easier it's more cost effective to to take your current you know, multifamily building plans, tweak it to comply with your passive house standards effectively at the same cost, but at the lower operating cost into the future for everybody who lives there. It's just about taking, we're not going to build it the way we used to, we're going to build it like this, pretty much for the same money. It's just about doing the appropriate trade offs. Can you do the same kind of testing? Obviously, we love new construction. We love being at the front end and having that conversation and building this. But can you do the same kind of third party inspections on an existing building and try to get it back up to code or be able to measure that and, and improve the living space there? Just this morning. <laughs> Great. Just this, actually at the, at the change of the season. That's, that's when the phone starts ringing going, I don't want to have to deal with these cold floors in the winter again. I don't want to have to deal with icicles and ice dams again. There's plenty of existing homes that um, are performing deficiently, right? Um, so people know it as an energy audit. We generally kind of, we generalize a little bit more towards home performance. Your home is not performing the way you, you want it to. First, let's define what the issue is. Once we know that, then we can actually fix the problem instead of picking at symptoms, right? And then once we know what the issue is, then we can put together a plan and go, okay, well, you know, how far do we want to go with this? What's the logical cost effective way to get there? Um, and sometimes cost benefit analysis is figured in there. Sometimes it's just going, you know what, if the drywall is going to be open, why wouldn't we fix all those other things? We're like, well, that's not cost effective. When you factor in drywall replacement, it sure is. You know, access is the biggest challenge with existing homes, right? The house we were in this morning, uh, you know, the place has been renovated a handful of times since 1890. Um, there's fiberglass in the wall. It's acting like air filter in most places. You know, and how do you get to it? Well, everything's finished. They just finished everything. You know, so nobody wants to crack in from the inside. So now you're looking at. Fortunately for this house, the siding is old and needs to be replaced. So now we're going. There's your next window of opportunity. And literally, the windows need to be changed as well. Again, best time to do that is is when the cladding is being removed. Um, so you know, Mark talked about sequencing. Sequencing is, is absolutely key when it comes to doing home improvements. We have a lot of homeowners that just kind of slapdash like, oh, I think we're going to do this. Maybe we'll do windows. Maybe we'll do a furnace. You know, and what do you think the insulation guy is going to recommend? And what do you think the window guy is going to recommend? The question is, what's the logical cost effective way that gets me to where I want to go with my house um, with the least amount of headache? You know, if I can do cost effective air sealing and insulating, I can reduce my heating cooling load. My furnace can last a little bit longer. I can save a little bit of money. I can more easily afford the windows that I have to get, that I have to replace, which will also let my furnace run a little longer. So when it finally poops out, now I can put a smaller, more efficient furnace in a building enclosure that's been improved. You know? Home performance. Yeah. Home performance and sequencing, those are the two greatest words in the dictionary right here. So. Um, this has been an amazing conversation. I, I appreciate Mark and Emily and Joe for you guys being here and educating us because I think education and having the conversation is key to having a better place to live. So thank you for Thanks. being here. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. And I'm Audrey Grabesic with Offsite Dirt. Another exciting show on education, performance, and sequencing. Who would have thought? All of those things built a greater tomorrow. So thank you for being here on Offsite Dirt.